Sorry for the delay. Technology difficult. Um, this talks about basic code. Basic code was a, um, a cross-platform basic API that arose from the, um, the Dutch hobby scene back in the 1980s. And it's quite interesting because it, it's an example of a bunch of geeks really coming together, having a problem solving it. And um, this kind of taking off for about 10 years after that. And um, essentially, the summary of it is they wanted to find a way of transmitting software over radio that would work on many different um, many different kind of 1980s microcomputers. So this talk has a bit of a, a history focus, but there should also, if I have time, be a um, retro computing demo at the end. Um, if I can go to the next slide. Oh, that doesn't seem to be the case. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry about the uh, horrible technology, but... So just to set the scene, in the, the early 1980s, um, it became possible to create computers that would fit on somebody's desktop. So these were microcomputers because they were small compared to the computers people were used to at the time. And um, everybody really wanted to jump onto that bandwagon. So basically every typewriter manufacturer, every radio manufacturer uh, went and, and built one of these microcomputers. So we can see here some examples. There's a Commodore PET, there's an Apple II, there's a Tandy Radio Shack 80, um, also known by people who love it as the Trash 80, and uh, Philips P2000T, and that's a thing called the XD Sorcerer that I hadn't heard of ever before doing this talk. Um, <clears throat> so these, as you can see, especially the PET, it shows you it has a, a cassette player, the P2000T has a cartridge. Some of these had, um, had floppy disk players, but uh, cassettes, audio cassettes were really the way of getting software into these things. And generally also, these things would boot into BASIC. They wouldn't really have an operating system. Um, they'd have a BASIC, and it would be a Microsoft BASIC. Microsoft had really cornered the market for 8-bit BASICs back from the time when they had built MITS Altair BASIC, which fit in 4K, which was, you know, really a cool thing. At the time, Microsoft did cool things. And... Um, <clears throat> So everybody who built one of these essentially went and bought BASIC from Microsoft, except Apple, they built their own. Um, now, that doesn't mean they were the same BASICs. They were all... So Microsoft has a Z80 BASIC and a six, uh, 6502 BASIC, but all these uh, manufacturers, they wanted something special for themselves. Um, so they licensed it, they made some changes. Uh, in the end, all of these BASICs were similar but incompatible. So just to show some simple basic program, just also to set like what is programming like in this awful language. Um, this is TRS-80 basic, so you can see a four next loop, clear the screen, and then you can do some print, formatted printing in TRS-80 basic, it was quite spiffy. Um, you couldn't do that in Commodore basic, so to clear the screen you had to print character 144, clear the screen if you did that. Um, but in Commodore basic you could leave out the spaces, so it would take up fewer bytes on your, um, so it was also less readable. Um, and this is Apple Basic down here, nice and neat, of course. Um, but to clear the screen here, you'd use the text command. So one of the things you can see, for instance, a simple thing, clearing your text screen, three basics, very similar, but all different commands do that. Um, so that's a problem. And um, that's a problem we'll get back to. But before we go there, so how you've got one of these PCs, how do you get software in there? Well, you could go out and buy a tape, but well, I certainly didn't have the money to do that, so you didn't really. So you could swap tapes with your friends, if you had friends, unlike me. Um, <laughs> or you could get some magazines and they had printed programs in them, and you would go and type the programs, and you would run it, and your computer would crash, and you'd forgot to save it. You'd have to start all over again. This time you saved it, ran it, didn't run because there was an error, so you could find which line was the error in, try and fix it. Um, it took hours and hours, but, you know, if you're a child, you've got time, so um, these are the kind of things. So there were, there were tons and tons of magazines. You can find a lot of them on the Internet these days, Compute Magazine, um, Creative Computing. Um, a lot of them were specific to one particular platform. So here I can see an Aiken one and a Sinclair one. I just ripped these, these pictures off the Internet. Um, but um, this is from... I think compute, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, but generally, this is kind of the sort of hell you had to type in. And 
Also, if the magazine you had, you know, had a nice game, you wanted that, but you didn't quite have um, an Atari, you had a Commodore. So what you could do is try and type it in and start modifying it until it worked on your Commodore. Now that was not easy because all these basics were different. <coughs> so some magazines would helpfully give you some hints as to what you would have to change for a different platform. So maybe on a Commodore you have to change this command. On IBM, this, this is a bit later because IBM PC came up a bit, became popular a bit later. Um, you'd, you'd have to change it here. Some magazines came with really helpful cheat sheets. This is from Personal Computer Magazine, Dutch magazine, um, which essentially gave you the sort of basic commands and how they worked in all various different kinds of basics. So there's like 20-ish different platforms. They're all slightly different, but very similar here. This was like an A2 sized poster. I think we had one in school. It was, um, but um, generally still quite unsatisfactory. You have to type all this stuff. So what people really wanted was some way of downloading stuff. I mean, this is not a term that people used at the time, but, um, Well, apart from the sort of the magazine scene, there was also a scene of radio amateurs. There was a scene of people doing cool stuff on the radio. They were often electronic geeks. They were often interested in computers. And one of the things they were trying to think is like, can we trans transmit computer software over radio? And the first side is obvious, right? Because these things work with audio tapes. So there's an actual audio cassette. I mean, I think the people here are mostly old enough to know it. Um, it, it was actually sound recorded on a tape. It was modulated, much in the way a modem does it. And um, so that sound was played into the computer. It would demodulate it and turn it back into a program. So at first, this is what they tried. So they had like four target platforms. Um, I'm speaking about a particular radio program, which is Hobbyscope, which was a um, Dutch NOS. It's a Dutch broadcaster. had this program once or twice a week, I think. And they did a lot of experiments. Uh, with radio, they were allowed by their bosses to do stuff, to break stuff and do interesting stuff. So they tried doing stereo when everybody else did mono. And um, so they could make noises and stuff because programs on audio, it's fairly awful noise. It's a lot like, you know, pulling your nails down a blackboard. I think you're kind of old enough to know what a blackboard is. But oh, here is one. I'm not going to do it. Um, <laughs> but in any case, so you had four different platforms. Well, actually, they all had cassettes, but they all did it in a slightly different way. So if you have a weekly program, and you're not going to spend hours you know, scratching on blackboards, so maybe you could do one Commodore uh, one week, the next week you do an Atari, etc. So this took forever. And moreover, a lot of these, um, these modulation schemes, they were designed for on a cassette. It's not that much noise compared to a radio. So quite often they weren't robust enough to survive radio transmission. So this didn't really work. It was a great idea. It didn't really work. But they sort of, um, they kept on with it. Sorry, I need to check the time occasionally. And um, so they, they thought, well, you know, this problem we can solve. We can kill two birds and one stone here. What if we design our own modulation scheme? We, th we take one that we know is robust to radio transmission. And we're going to write software for each of these four platforms that we're looking at. It was actually the four that I showed before. So it was the PET, it was the TRS-80, it was the XD Sorcerer, and it was the Apple II, I think. Uh, Philips P2000 came later. Um, so we're going to write programs. We're going to sell them so people will pay us money, and we send them the tape. Um, and that will demodulate modulate, um, this sort of standard scheme. It's based on the Kansas City standard, if that means anything to you. And um, this way we can transmit one program in one, in one go, and people can record it, use this program to decode it, and use it on their machine. Um, so just to show you what this looks like, this is how the letter J would be transmitted. Um, it was a 1,200 baud um, scheme, which means 1,200 bits per second. Um, it had some start bits, some stop bits to frame a byte, 8-bit byte bytes, um, unlike the PDP that we saw earlier in, in one of the main talks. And um, it had sort of a pilot tone at the start and um, some error correction. There was a checksum at the end. Um, the bit would be in least significant first, the byte. So actually what we're seeing here, and also for some reason that eludes me the last bit. So that's the most significant bit was inverted. So actually we have 0, 1, 
001010, which, if you're quick with binary, is the ASCII code for letter J, is the number 74. So um, this worked very well, and they were very proud of it, and they were so proud of it that they did a television transmission. And there's a still here um, of that. So this was in 1981. It was, again, a Dutch program called Horizon. And on air, well, on TV, they showed somebody transmitting this program and people sort of loading it into their pets. And I don't really recognize these other machines, but into five different machines. And they could load it and had to do a bit of modifications. And then they could run it. And, well, it was brilliant. I mean, oh, to be alive in such an age when this is possible, right? Um, <clears throat> So, now, it's brilliant to the point, well, now we solve the transmission problem. What we haven't solved is the compatibility issue. Remember, all of these basics were, like, annoyingly slightly different. Like, for instance, clearing the screen is difficult. Yet, so these people would have to go in and change the clear screen command to whatever it was on their platform. So the next step they took, so what we just saw was basic code version 1. The next step they took in 1983 was what if we abstract that stuff out? So all the sort of standard things we want to do a lot, like clearing the screen, moving the cursor to a certain position on the text screen. At the start, it was all text-based. Um, what if we write routines for that? Now, BASIC didn't have named, um, sub, uh, didn't have named um, functions. Um, it didn't have named procedures you could go into. It had line numbers. You could jump to a line number. But you could jump to a line number and then jump back to where you were before, which was the go sub command. So go sub jumps into a subroutine. So they defined standard subroutines. Subroutine number 100, 100 would clear the screen. So instead of writing CLS on one and text on another, you'd write go sub 100. And the next version, the version 2 of the demodulation program, would actually include a standard set of subroutines for your platform onto the program that you just downloaded. So you wouldn't just see this. You would see a bunch of code on top of that which defines subroutine 100. It would define the go to 20 is a bit old, right? Because you don't see it coming back. But it jumps back to 1010. Uh, couldn't be a subroutine because they had to change. They had to clear the memory at that point, And that would drop the go sub stack, obviously. So you couldn't actually go sub into 20. It had to go to in it. And it would jump you back to 1010. Um, so this is the same program I show, showed before. It's just a simple thing that prints false stem And then with an increasing line number, runs over it. and then sort of goes back and, and does it all over again. It's a bit silly, but I had to write something quickly. Um, but this was the real innovation that actually this, this API, again, modern parlance, that defined these go subs that would do the things that you'd want to do but were difficult in different versions of BASIC, um, that really made things take off. Um, so, Suddenly, you could actually download a program over radio. And they were actually transmitting these programs, and people were using them. So this was all still on Dutch radio first. And it really caught on. And other broadcasters called, got onto it. So particularly the BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation, you might be aware of it. They had a program called The Chip Shop, which was about computers. What is happening in the world of computers, something along those lines. And they started a chip shop takeaway service. So the chip shop takeaway service, they would transmit um, basic code software, and um, yeah, they would basically use the same programs that. Sorry, this this is not going to work. I'm just I'm not very good with technology. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I had uh, the sound thing, but I, I can try it at the end if, if there's time or not. I'm not going to try it now. Um, so the BBC got into the game. The um, the West Germans initially got into the game. They published a book and they had a few transmissions. It really it didn't really get big in West Germany at the time, um, but it was big in the Netherlands. It was big in the UK for a while, and in particular on schools, there were lots of educational software. And people called this the Esperanto for microcomputers. At the time, that meant something to people. Esperanto was this international language that was going to replace English. Never happened. And um, so I'm not really going into this, but it won't surprise you in sort of this being an open source conference that what caused the fork between version 2 and version 3 was disagreement about the licensing. Um, and that meant another broadcaster came in. There was a third version, did color and graphics, and it was cooler, but then it was stuck with the old version. But the interesting bit 
at least a bit I find quite fascinating, is that um, towards the end of the 80s and towards the end of the life of the German Democratic Republic, East Germany, um, it actually... So in early 1981, nobody thought the... You know, they just had 40 years of East Germany. They thought there would be another 40 years. The war was, was going to be there forever. So... Um, previous speaker mentioned already, like across, across the Iron Curtain, this was a completely different world. It was a bit mysterious and we didn't know about it. So the German Democratic Republic, um, they built their own computers. So this is a Robotron. So the uh, Volkseigene Betrieb Robotron, sort of the state, state company that built computers. Um, so these were used, but they were very difficult to get. Um, so they, like, like companies would have them and schools maybe, but people at home Quite often, they'd have Western computers if they could get their hands on them. Um, so what Radio DDR wants to do, so the state broadcaster, um, was they had a, a sort of 10-course basic, how to, how to do programming in basic. And they built it for Robotron computers, because obviously that was their own stuff. And um, they also wanted to transmit software over the radio, and they did that for Robotron. It sort of worked, but they kind of ran into the same issues as people had in the West. And interestingly, obviously, um, Berlin, divided city, people in the West could listen to the Eastern radio. Um, interestingly, there was a listener in, in West Berlin who also listened to Dutch radio because this was trans the Dutch broadcasts were on medium wave. Medium wave goes quite far, so you could actually get it in Berlin. Um, and Dutch being close enough to German for this guy to understand basically what it was about, he was aware of this basic code protocol and this basic code software, and he wrote a letter to Radio DDR saying, are you guys aware of what's happening in Holland? And could, this could be interesting for what you're trying to do with your, with your basic cores, which I very much like, etc. Um, so they did, and they were very enthusiastic. And um, they, uh, they sent a delegation to the Netherlands um, to have some negotiations, and essentially they licensed basic code to use it in East Germany. Um, now, around about this time in the West the IBM PC really started to dominate, and there wasn't really a need for basic code anymore, especially in the early 90s. Um, people, people didn't really need this anymore. But in, in this way, in the East, for a few more years, even though the DDR stopped existing, for a few more years, it sort of had a lease of life on, um, on East Germany. And they, there's an a interesting picture of a vinyl record um, which they used instead of cassette tapes, because cassette tapes were rare and difficult to get. Um, here we get to the sort of um, uh, retro computing part of it. So today we have a replacement of basic code. Today we have JavaScript, which is also an ugly language, which is also the first language people learn when they go into school, and they sort of try and do little things, and it works on every platform. And, um, yeah, it's... Um, the, to me, the obvious thing was, well, what if you have a basic code implementation in JavaScript? So I built a basic interpreter doing exactly that. I wasn't the first one to do that, but it's better. Um, <laughs> uh, mine's compatible with basically every basic code program I could find. And the other thing I did was document every basic code program I could find, taking it from the original audio and putting it on the internet. So it's all in, all in GitHub these days. Um, I was hoping to demo this, but that means I need to do scary things with technology. Um, but basically the way it works is you put a script tag in, and rather than having a standard script, you call it text basic code. And this little script I wrote will replace them all with a canvas and start running the interpreter and, and basically run your programming. Here are some examples. Um, this one I wrote myself, and these are just sort of old. It's a Russian course, and Pythagoras 3, um, Sun and Moon sort of... Um, Thing. These were the sort of educational things that you could get on basic code at the time. The interpreter is a fairly standard affair. I, I've got little background in doing this, so I probably reinvented the wheel a hundred times, but um, there you go. Um, now, let me just first show you the last slide, and then I go try and go into the demo, because I'm not sure about whether that's going to work or not. But this is just a thank you to a lot of people. I mean, I, I ripped most of the contents of this talk from, from these people and these publications. There's a bunch of links on the, um, on the GitHub place where you can also find all the basic code and a link to the interpreter and the demo that I'm trying to make now, which I have really no idea whether I'm going to make that work. Yeah, I might be able to. Right, so 
I've got two, so here's actually the program I just showed. And this is what it does. It's really fascinating. Um, but so let's see if I, um, now I need to get to, yeah. So this is one of the programs, one of the educational programs that was published. Um, so it will show radioactive decay. Um, we're not going to read stuff, instructions. So let's just jump into the experiment. This will just show how radioactive decay worked. And you basically see these, um, these atoms decaying until not many are left. And then I think it would tell you how long it took or what the half-life was. Um, well, anyway, the, yeah, so this, this tells you the instructions. So this is kind of an example of, of one of the early ones. You'd have, um, you'd have some educational things, but you'd also have little games like it as a car race. Um, I don't want instructions because I don't have time. And let's, okay. <laughs> again, yes. So this goes way too fast, but um, you, you kind of get the message. Um, yeah, this, this is going to draw everybody's attention also because our kind hosts are... This is... Um, you'll, you'll know the statue. There's a little statue in Brussels, right? Monica Piss. And it's a little boy that pees. And I think I need to sort of put, give it a power and an angle. And then, so I miss the... I need, to, I need to pee into the little pot over there. So I think I need more power. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I mentioned I was bad at technology, didn't I? Uh, well, that's not too bad, but yeah, too much power. So again, you know, it, it's kind of educational. It teaches you something about ballistics <laughs> in a way that captures people's attention. And um, also think at this point, I am kind of running out of time if we want to do any more questions. So let me, um, are there any questions? Let me just put ourselves back to the... Oh, this is not going to work, is it? Um, okay, are there any questions? <laughs> yes? Why doesn't the modulation on used on cassette doesn't work on radio? Because it's very similar. So you, the question is, why doesn't the modulation that was used on cassette work on radio? Because it's very similar. So the answer to that is it sort of works, but um, it was often, I think, too fast and not... Um, it might not have a lot of framing bytes or things that would make the transmission more robust, so kind of error correction features. There weren't a lot of error correction features in here, but it was quite a slow transmission rate, and it was done in a way that people knew was fairly robust against the noise. Radio has just a lot more noise than cassette tape has, and I think that was the problem they mainly tried to solve, and that was why some of the modulation schemes on cassette didn't really work very well. That, um, the record way in the red. Hmm. Yes. So I think if you if you if you really over um, there's a word for that I forgot. But yeah, if you put it way in the red, if you oversaturate it, yeah, then um, uh, you mentioned it worked better. I think that's because then you kind of force it to be a square wave, and I think the software did just much better with square waves. Um, so I think that was one. Uh, you 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 sound like you did this at the time. Yeah. <laughs> I tried at the time. I couldn't. I somehow I, I never made it work. So you know, I, I caught up later. There's a question at the back. Yeah, thank you. How many people use it? Uh, oh, that's a good question. How many people have actually used basic codes? Oh, that's quite a lot of people. Uh, that's really good to see. Um, so if you if you want to, you know, go back to the old times, you now know where to go. Um, the sample. Yeah, let's try and go to the sample. Um, <laughs> well, this is from the chip shop, but see, my problem is if I go here, maybe put it. Yeah, it's just that. Ah, hey, thank you. <laughs> Can we hear it now? Is there a play button? No. 
Clearly not written in data, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, oh. Can we hear anything? I can try and play it here and turn it up loud, but I'll have to turn off the screen. Uh, yes. Can people hear this? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm running out of time. And I can't get to the slider because this this sort of thing gets in the way. Sorry, I'm just um. I think we've run out of time, so sorry about that. Uh, we can try if people are interested to uh, to make to to yeah to show you how it sounds. Yeah, you, you get some. If you've ever heard a modem, it sounds a lot like that. Yeah. Um, so I'll stop taking up the time of the next speaker. So thanks very much for your interest. And, uh,